Thanks for joining us for this symposium. I'm Bill Rapisi, President and CEO of the Lymphatic Education Research Network. Lauren's mission is to fight lymphatic diseases through education, research, and advocacy. In order to win a fight, you first have to join it. So we ask, please become a supporting member of LEARN at lymphaticnetwork.org. And we hope you enjoy today's symposium. Well, good morning um, to all our um, very loyal uh, LEARN friends. I thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, today's webinar actually has two topics. They're both updates of material that many of you, I hope, will have heard about in the past, but I think worth telling you what's happening. Uh, so as you see, we're going to be talking about the HEAL trial, which is my uh, clinical trial to test the first drug that we hope will be made ultimately commercially available to treat lymphedema. And we'll also uh, have an update at the end uh, regarding the LEARNS uh, Lymphatic International Registry. And there are some exciting things to tell you about that as well. I also want to mention that as many of you know, LEARN is the grateful recipient of a grant from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. Uh, and that organization is very anxious to learn from us about what is the status of lymphedema and lymphedema treatment in the United States. And to that end, you can help us and yourselves extraordinarily uh, by uh, participating in a very short five-minute survey. Your link to that survey will appear as you leave this webinar. So please uh, be prepared for that and be prepared to participate if it's at all uh, possible for you. So before we begin, just a couple of introductory comments. I would like to gratefully acknowledge the support of our commercial sponsors that you see listed uh, on this slide. Please um, support them in turn to the extent that you're able. And a disclaimer uh, to you that um, <clears throat> this is not intended to be a forum for specific medical advice and that you're uh, advised to consult with your healthcare professional for any questions that you have about your own personal health and treatment. <clears throat> so many of you know that I have been on the trail to find drug therapy for lymphedema for a big part of the last 30 years. And I've conducted a number of clinical trials. This is a question that I get asked pretty much every day of my life, certainly as long as I've been conducting these clinical trials. And unfortunately, uh, the, the conduct of a clinical trial is long and a bit arduous. But I do hope that we are currently involved in what will be the definitive path to commercialization of drug therapy. Now, just to remind those of you that have seen this slide before and those that are seeing it for the first time, how very complex it is to set up a clinical trial even before one begins. And um, you all should know that before this trial was launched in roughly August, September of 2022, um, there was about 18 months of activity that led up to the specific organization of that uh, trial. I'm very grateful to the um, sponsorship, which I uh, received uh, through a competitive granting application from the um, Innovative Medicines Accelerator Program at Stanford, and also for a corporate sponsor who is providing both funding and the drug uh, that we are testing investigationally. And this uh, company is called Celtaxis. Now, in order for you to understand the approach that we're taking, uh, I want to first underscore the fact that some of you know, but maybe not all of you know, that even though, um, as those of you that have lymphedema look down at a part of the body, whether it's an arm or a leg or multiple parts of the body, and see an increase in size, maybe not everybody acknowledges that the lymphatics that are under active or, or impaired in lymphedema live in layers of the skin, and it is therefore the skin that becomes affected by lymphedema. So where the limb is swelling, although it looks like the entire limb is swollen, it actually is the outer layers of the limb, which is to say the skin and the subcutaneous fat that lives directly beneath the skin and is considered 
part of the skin. So as the lymphatics become impaired, there is accumulation of fluid. That fluid resides in the skin layer and eventually uh, encourages the skin to change its very architecture to grow in thickness. And eventually what has historically been called the irreversible phase of lymphedema, in fact, is when that fluid accumulation becomes transformed into an equivalent increase in volume of the tissues themselves. As the cells grow in number and size, um, this becomes the swelling that the therapist sometimes can no longer reduce adequately because uh, while fluid can be stimulated to leave a swollen limb, cells cannot. And once they become enlarged, they are there to stay. I'm going to move on to the next slide and show you that what led to the development of the current clinical trial and the current drug that we are testing is our observation, both in humans and also very much more intimately in animal models, to show that when we are looking at this increased thickness of the skin and the subcutaneous tissues, that they do respond to a specific drug-induced reduction as we have discovered the mechanism that allows the accumulation of the fluid to eventually lead to this increase in mass uh, and are delighted to discover that in fact these changes, while they were clinically always uh, deemed irreversible, in fact are reversible if one reverses the molecular mechanisms that are driving them. So this has led us to the organization of what we are calling the HEAL trial, the Human Lymphedema ACE Bilostat trial. It's registered on clinicaltrials.gov, and you can see its registration number there. Uh, we are using a drug that has a generic name of ACE Bilostat. It is a drug that is given by mouth currently as a once-a-day dose. It is a small molecule, and it inhibits the enzyme uh, called leukotriene A4 hydrolase or LTA4 hydrolase, which is responsible for the production of LTB4 or leukotriene B4. And that is the molecule that is driving all of the abnormality that I showed you on the prior slide uh, within the skin. And when we block that enzyme uh, and therefore block the production of LTB4, we are helping the body to restore its normal uh, architectural um, uh, structure, as well as its function. I want to make the point right now, because some of you may have questions about this, and I also want to make the point that I'm going to leave plenty of time for question and answer, hopefully at the end of the, of the session. I won't uh, spend uh, the entire time speaking, because many of you will have questions on this or tangential issues. But I want to make the point that even though this is a, uh, considered to be a form of anti-inflammatory therapy. This does not block the ability of individuals to have normal and desired forms of inflammation. I like to think of leukotriene B4 as having a function very similar to the bellows that you might have next to your fireplace if you, if you uh, have a fireplace in your home, which is to say, once you create a fire, and the fire starts to dwindle, instead of putting more kindling on the fire or more or more fuel, which would cause the blaze to go up again, you can actually increase the size of the flame by simply using the bellows and, and, and putting more, more air into the system. And LTB4 functions very much in that way. It is an ancillary pathway. Uh, the primary pathways of inflammation are left intact but for some reason, this ancillary pathway gets turned on to an inappropriate degree, and that's what allows lymphedema to have the specific biology that it has. So moving on to the trial, the Human Lymphedema ACE Bilostat trial, or HEAL, has uh, as its goal to um, look at individuals with single-arm lymphedema. We're not more interested in arms than legs. 
Uh, and we do believe that this therapy will work ultimately for all forms of lymphedema, but we chose arm lymphedema because the patients with arm lymphedema are more similar to one another than our patients with in lymphedema in any other part of the body. And this allows us to draw statistically relevant conclusions with a much smaller group of patients to be enrolled than we would otherwise need if we opened it up to all forms of lymphedema. So I think sometimes uh, people with leg lymphedema think that we are prejudiced against them because so many trials are done in breast cancer-related lymphedema. We're interested in all forms of lymphedema, but we also want to get to the finish line as quickly as we can. Uh, the lymphedema has to be at least six months of duration or any time thereafter. Gender is not an issue in this trial, and it is a trial of adult patients. Uh, one of the aspects of the trial that you may not be familiar with is the fact that in our prior work in humans, because we knew that the skin thickness was such an important part of the, of the drug response, we have used um, skin thickness calipers to measure changes. Uh, but we decided that uh, if we're interested in thickness of the skin and the layers of the skin, we could gain even more information by using ultrasound. So the ultrasound probe um, is placed on the skin. I call it a butterfly kiss because you can hardly feel it. But in placing it in this way and in very designated locations, we can actually capture images at each time that we uh, investigate uh, the subject and then make very precise quantitative measures of all of the aspects of the skin. So as you can see here, we're looking at the lymphedema arm and the normal arm, and we place the probe in three distinct locations, and we will average the, the values obtained in each of those locations on each limb. And here you can see uh, the way in which we can designate the dermis, which is the outermost layer uh, of the skin, the part of the skin that uh, gets a suntan or a sunburn when you're out in the sun uh, as, as the uh, place that we can make our primary measurements. Now, um, what I need to share today is the fact that the trial itself is ongoing and we have enrolled about a third or a little more than a third of the desired number of subjects. We hope to complete uh, the enrollment process in the trial uh, during calendar year 2024. Um, but the design of the trial is such that we're not allowed to make any objective measurements on, on any of the subjects, even though many have already completed the trial, until everybody completes the trial. So what I'm going to talk to you about today are two ancillary subjects that I think will uh, give you some excitement about what's going on in the HEAL trial and hopefully encourage those of you that would be eligible to, uh, to participate, to indeed participate, or if you have any friends or family members or acquaintances or anybody that you know that might be a good candidate for the HEAL trial, uh, we would love uh, to have uh, those individuals included as well. However, what I'm going to show you today is some of the power that is inherent in this dermal ultrasound approach that we have employed in this trial. This is the first time that I think this has been done in such an acutely quantitative way. And I'm going to stick my neck out and say that this is going to become a diagnostic and surveillance tool for the future that will uh, in many ways replace the more invasive kind of imaging that we currently do for lymphedema. I'm quite, quite excited about this. But I wanna share with you uh, some analysis we did in the first 25 subjects um, that we looked at where we are able to look at the baseline images that we acquire before we do anything to the patient in the way of um, giving them medication, uh, just to see what we can learn from these baseline uh, images. So we got the ultrasound images in the lymphedema arm and the normal arm uh, with ul identical ultrasound settings. Um, and we eventually looked at these baseline images in a random order and a radiologist uh, quantified them and what did not know anything about the individual subject. So he's simply looking at uh, the acquired images and then we did an appropriate statistical analysis. So this will show you what we are actually looking at with these ultrasounds. Um, and so uh, what, you, what your eye will show you immediately, and I'll share some numbers with you in a moment, is that 
On the upper panel, we're looking at the lymphedema arm and the square in white that you see is uh, showing you uh, what the skin layer itself looks like. And then the line that you see that is labeled ST is, uh, is the subcutaneous fat. So it should become immediately apparent to your eye that both the dermis or the skin, I should say, uh, what's in the square, as well as the subcutaneous fat is rather substantially increased in size in the lymphedema arm compared to the normal arm of the same subject, which is what you're looking at here. So as we look at various aspects that we can measure within the skin itself, we can look at the overall thickness of the dermis, which is the the layer of the skin immediately beneath the dead cells that get shed every day from the outer surface of your skin. We can look at the epidermis, which is that layer of dead cells, and we can look at various sublayers of the dermis itself. And you can see that in each case, whether we're looking at the total dermal thickness, the total epidermal thickness, or each of the layers of the dermis, uh, those asterisks that you see uh, above um, the connecting lines show that these differences are quite statistically significant, all of them. And three out of the four are highly significantly different. So it's quite clear that lymphedema causes these measurements to increase in an intra-subject comparison with the normal arm. And these um, changes are indeed uh, quite significant. So each of the dots that you see is a specific patient and now we're looking at the, the average values are the horizontal lines. And because the horizontal line in the lymphedema arm is above the horizontal line in the normal arm, it shows that that is an increase in the average measured thickness, and that is highly significant. So um, the same thing is true of the subcutaneous thickness, which again, as we've said, is predominantly uh, fat. Those of you that are aware of this know that one of the surgical treatments for lymphedema for later stage lymphedema is to go in surgically and actually remove that subcutaneous fat by liposuction. But here you can see evidence of the degree to which that layer is increased. And again, it is uh, statistically significant comparing uh, to the normal side. Now, the, what we did um, next is a little bit more unique than what exists in the literature thus far, which does acknowledge dermal uh, ultrasound as a way to measure skin thickness. But we decided to look at what's called the echogenicity of the various layers of the skin. Echogenicity means that when we do an ultrasound, we are putting high-frequency sound through the probe into the tissue that's being examined and then the probe picks up the amount of sound that bounces off the structures and comes back to the probe. So the more sound that comes back indicates that there is greater thickness of the tissue, and that is what we call echogenicity. What you see on the image is the whiter the image is, the more echogenic it is, the blacker the image is, the more uh, echolucent it is, meaning how it is less thick. And what varies here is the content of water and air. And if, uh, a, if a um, tissue is predominantly composed of uh, water or air or fat, it's going to be very non-echo dense. So what you see here is that the subcutaneous layer in the normal arm is relatively black, whereas the skin is relatively white, which is to say, if we um, were to do a ratio between the skin and the fat, that ratio would be elevated. Now, what we observed in these studies is that in lymphedema, the layers of the skin lose echogenicity and the subcutaneous fat gains echogenicity. That's what you see on those graphs on the left-hand side. Well, what is the explanation for that? A, I don't know because I would have to do some very primary investigation on that and would probably involve animal subjects. But here is my hypothesis. I think that the layers of the skin 
become less echo dense, uh, uh, dense because the skin cells, which normally are compacted and, and lie against one another in, in very flat um, sheets within the skin, I believe as the skin accumulates fluid, it separates those sheets of, of cells. And, the, and because there is separation between them, the uh, echogenicity decreases. Conversely, in the fat layer, which ordinarily has almost no cellular content and is composed entirely of accumulated fat, I think what happens in lymphedema is there is accumulation of water within the fat layer, which makes it more echo-dense than it should be ordinarily. So each of the two layers move in an opposite direction because of the accumulation of water, which would mean, ideally, that if our treatment were successful, we would encourage um, the changes to move in the appropriate normal direction to separate back from one another again. So here's an example of exactly that relationship. We are looking at the ratio of echogenicity within the skin or the dermis to the echogenicity in the fat layer or the subcutaneous layer. And what you'll see is that on the left-hand panel, that ratio begins to decline toward one when lymphedema is present when in comparison to the paired normal arm where the number is quite a bit higher. The average is about two and a half. So that change is highly statistically significant as you see from the asterisks there. And again, my belief is that what we are looking at is the difference between fluid accumulation in those two layers versus the absence or relative absence of fluid in the normal situation. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to again summarize for you what the HEAL trial itself is about, and then I'm going to share what I hope is some very interesting uh, information for you. So again, um, looking at it more broadly, Broadly, we have both inclusion and exclusion criteria for the HEAL trial. Um, so this is a study of single-sided stage two chronic lymphedema of an arm with a duration of at least six months. If somebody has had surgical intervention for that lymphedema, we need at least one year to have elapsed prior to screening, and we need to have evidence that there is still substantial involvement uh, with uh, the lymphedema. Uh, and of course, the patient needs to be able to sign the informed consent document. Um, we need patients to have completed their physical therapy at least two months prior to the screening visit. And we hope that the patients will maintain all treatment strategies that are in place at the time of enrollment throughout the uh, period of observation, which is nine months. Uh, we are not enrolling anybody who is planning surgical intervention before the uh, end of the of, of the trial period, and we are excluding individuals who have other reasons to have uh, swelling of a limb. Uh, pregnant and nursing participants are excluded. Now, um, as I shared with you already, I can't tell you anything about what's happening uh, to these subjects within the HEAL trial, except that I can tell you that our enrolled subjects are very happy with their responses during the trial. But in terms of objective documentation, that will have to wait until uh, we, uh, until we uh, complete the trial. However, what, is, what I can share with you and what is very good news is that because of the promise of this therapy, the FDA has allowed me to establish an expanded access program at Stanford for patients who are not uh, able to participate in the main trial. So these are patients predominantly with leg lymphedema. Uh, patients with cancer-related lymphedema are not allowed to participate, unfortunately. So these are predominantly individuals who have leg lymphedema from other causes who are able to take the study drug in a non-study context. We are giving it clinically, but of course we're allowed to follow the patients clinically and therefore can make very similar measurements as we track their response uh, uh, to the drug. I'm also able to announce with great uh, pride that we are about to launch a similar expanded access program uh, for lipedema, 
Uh, we are excited about the prospect of this drug in lipedema because of the changes that we are seeing, not only in the skin, but also in the subcutaneous fat layer, which makes us think that lipedema would also be an ideal potential candidate for the drug. So what I'm going to share with you are the measurements that we were able to take at three months after exposure to the drug in our first five participants. So this is very early data. By this point, um, although I haven't analyzed everything yet, we've actually completed six months of treatment um, in, um, in close to 12 patients. And we're hoping to expose these subjects to aspilostat for at least a year in order to see what their optimal response is. But what we are seeing among the first five patients is that uh, limb volume uh, pretty uniformly declines even at a very early time point when we don't really expect to have much in the way of drug response yet. Uh, and you can see that the percent change uh, in limb volume is, is, is rather substantial. These are small numbers, so we have not attained statistical significance yet. But where we have attained statistical significance is by that older measure that I shared with you of measuring the skin thickness with a caliper. And here you can see that pretty uniformly skin thickness is becoming statistically significantly reduced in all subjects as early as three months after exposure to ACE Bilistat. Um, and I should share with you that in my earlier work with ketoprofen, we actually saw that it typically took at least six months of drug exposure to be able to measure much of anything in the way of a significant change. So this is more robust than what we have previously experienced with older drugs. And I should share that ACE Bilistat is a much more targeted drug. Uh, this is looking at the percent change in skin thickness. Um, compared to baseline. And again, uh, even though the, the numbers are small and it's very early, we did attain a highly significant change even at this early time point. The, the circle that you see in yellow represents one of our subjects who has a generalized lymphatic anomaly, which includes uh, protein losing enteropathy, which means the lymphatics in his intestine are leaking lymph into the intestine where he loses a great deal of protein. And this individual, uh, after uh, three months of exposure to ACE Bilistat, um, uh, had a substantial improvement in his blood albumin levels, which is uh, in part responsible for his very dramatic improvement that's an indirect and a direct result of ACE Bilistat because he also has lymphedema in his leg and his genital region, and this became uh, significantly improved as well. Now, we talked quite a lot about the ultrasound in the early slides. I want to show you an example of the kind of ultrasound response that we are seeing uh, with ACE Bilistat. So you can see here, uh, in this case, this is not the normal side compared to the abnormal side, because in these individuals, almost entirely, they have both leg involvement. But this is the individual's pretreatment leg on the left-hand panel and the post-treatment leg on the, uh, sorry, the pretreatment uh, leg on the left panel, the post-treatment leg on the, on, on the right-hand panel. And you can see that both the skin, which is designated with a red vertical line, and the subcutaneous fat, which is designated with the yellow vertical line, and then the total thickness from the outside edge to the bottom of the fat, everything is substantially reduced. You can see total thickness reduced by about 18%, and quite dramatically, the fat layer decreased by over 20%. So we're very encouraged that we are seeing a very substantial result that is going to impact ultimately with, an in, with a decrease in total limb volume because in chronic lymphedema, most of the limb excess volume, 70 to 90%, is based upon the overgrowth of that fatty layer. So that's the promising news that I want to give you about the HEAL trial and what it is likely to teach us. And it is likely to put us on a, on a we hope, a direct path with the FDA uh, toward eventual commercialization of the drug. And we're very excited by the 
success not only of our enrollment in the HEAL trial, which we hope will continue, as well as the participation and the responses in the expanded access program. I can tell you that one of our subjects in the expanded access program has had to decrease his shoe size based upon shrinkage of his foot, which has not occurred throughout his adult experience with lymphedema. Um, many of our subjects have had to downsize their garments because they're becoming too loose as the limb is responding. We're really quite encouraged by this. Now, um, I do want to acknowledge again the IMA program at Stanford, as well as Cell Taxes. And this is my small but highly efficient team that works with me in performing not only the HEAL study, uh, but also the expanded access program. Now, I'd like to move over to the second uh, topic of updates, which is the LEARN International Lymphatic Disease Registry. Many of you know that this is a, has been a very important project of LEARN, LEARN nearly since its inception. I've been the principal investigator of this project uh, from its inception. Uh, and um, many of you, of course, have been participants. The update that I have for you is to tell you that um, there has been a major overhaul of the registry. Many of you will have seen, or if you go to the Learn website, you will currently see this landing page for the registry that will take you to the site where you can actually register and become a participant. Um, we have decided to move the IT platform where the data uh, resides. Uh, and in so doing, we decided to do a major overhaul of the platform itself. One of the um, strengths of the registry has been the fact that we are very exhaustive in the intake of data so that all of the data that we could ever potentially want to make available to uh, researchers will be available to them. The drawback is that um, because we have been very universal in approaching lymphatic disease, many of the questions that we ask are relevant to specific segments of the disease of, of the subject population and not to others, which means that there is wading through an extraordinary amount of material to get all of your personal data into the registry. We have redesigned things, as I'll show you in a moment. But before I do that, I want to underscore the importance of the registry. The registry was created primarily because we believe that lymphatic investigators all over the world need access to this data. And we wanted to create a platform and a resource for the investigative community. This will become available to anybody in the world who has a valid reason to look at de-identified subject data regarding lymphatic disease in order to conduct meaningful lymphatic research. So um, basically the registry subserves four uh, specific categories of, uh, of service. One is the sheer collection of data, the applicability in long-term follow-up, and we have set up the LEARN registry so that once you are in the registry at six-month intervals, we will remind you that we would love to know what has happened to you in the preceding six months in the way of change in treatment, change in severity of disease, hospitalizations, infections, change in medications, anything that might tell us how your lymphedema is behaving over time. This is also real world evidence. The kind of study that I just shared with you, the HEAL trial, gives us very important information, but it's a very controlled environment. And we know uh, in medicine in general, that there is a big difference between what happens in a clinical trial and what happens in the real world. And in the registry, we're looking at real world data. And as we get more and better treatment strategies for lymphedema, we will be able to do post-marketing surveillance. One, one element that I haven't listed here, but I think is equally important is for us to entice the commercial realm to be interested in lymphatic disease, they have to know something about how many of us are out there and what is the, um, the fingerprint or the photograph of the lymphatic disease community so that they know what, how interested they might be in developing new products. So here's what we have done with the registry. We have always believed that, um, and I, I call myself a lumper because 
I don't want specifically to split diseases apart and say, I'm only interested in secondary lymphedema, or I'm only interested in primary lymphedema, or I'm only interested in lipedema, or I'm only interested in vascular anomalies. I believe that these diseases are linked to one another because they all affect the lymphatics. And we can learn not only from those elements that are specific to subsets of these diseases, but these diseases can help to teach one another about the commonalities or where the differences are important. Therefore, it's important to have a repository where all of the information is present. And so we have created the lymphatic disease registry to em embrace all of these categories. As I said, the problem historically was you had to wade through the questions that were relevant to having these four broad categories, no matter what category your personal uh, entity resided in. We've changed that now. What will happen for those of you that become new participants is that when you enter the registry site, there will be a demographic intake. So we, we know how to contact you. We know who you are. We have your informed consent. And we have a few pieces of vital information about you that are not specifically related to your disease. At that point, you will be funneled into a pathway that is relevant to your specific disease. And all of the information that is collected and all the questions that are asked will be relevant uh, only to your specific uh, disease. And at the back end, uh, all of the questions that are universal can be asked at the very end. This makes it a much streamlined experience, and we hope one that is much more pleasant for anybody who will do it for the first time. Uh, for those of you that have been in the registry uh, already, uh, we have not abandoned you. Your information is still there. Uh, there will be a bit of an up update uh, process once you go into the new site, but everything will be intact and you can move forward with your uh, semi-annual updates. Now, the, the, the registry that we have been redesigned is in beta testing phase, and I believe it's just a matter of a few weeks before it will be unveiled to the public. I'm happy to say that the uh, existing registry has already been utilized in some of my research uh, for uh, the CDC, and the manuscript um, that we have written about that work is in editing form and is about to be submitted. So this will be the first publication in the medical literature that will specifically cite the International uh, Learn uh, Lymphatic Disease Registry. And I hope it is the first of many, many, many. And I hope that our work will encourage other investigators to apply to utilize the data that we have uh, present. The registry will go live, as I said, within a matter of a few weeks. And at that point, um, the link will be live on the LEARN website. So please keep looking there. And I do encourage all of you to participate uh, as soon as it is feasible to do so. I'd like to end by saying that this is my view of how a registry like this is important and how it is important to you. There are things that matter and there are things that you can control. And what you should focus on is the intersection between those two. And I believe the registry falls squarely within that black area between those two circles. So focus on it and help us to help you by encasing your information in a forum in which uh, it can help everyone. So with that, I'm going to say uh, thanks for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing my uh, screen here so that we can go uh, directly to uh, the time remaining for uh, question and answer. So let me see how I've got some questions here in the Q&A section, and I'll encourage you to continue to submit them, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, so uh, the question, the first question I see here, and I'm reading them live, so I have to see what, what they even ask. Um, there's somebody who's asking from Toronto, Canada, uh, when the trial is complete, uh, will Canadian doctors have access to this drug? The answer is um, step one will be for the US FDA to approve it. I believe um, the majority, if not all FDA approved drugs in the United States become available quickly in Canada and in many places around the world. So the answer would be yes, but I don't know what the time lag will be. Um, 
I'm asked if any of the over-the-counter supplements help. Uh, there are many leg and vein supplements out there. So the, the simple answer is um, that we don't have objective data for any of them, to be honest, with one exception that I'll mention uh, in, in a moment. And that is um, most of the supplements that are sold are are are. I have to say snake oil, uh, predominantly, as far as I know, there's no real reason to suspect that any of that helps uh, individuals uh, with lymphedema. However, there is a category of drugs that are called uh, flavonoids that have been studied for quite an extended period of time um, in vein disease and in chronic edema. And the ones that I typically recommend for whatever spillover effect they might have in the chronic edema of lymphedema would be uh, diosmin hesperidin uh, would be the number one candidate. The second one would be um, grape seed extract. And the third one um, would be horse chestnut seed extract. These are all drugs for which objective data exists in the literature and certainly can be considered. I do have to say that in lymphedema, if there's any impact at all, it's going to be very, very modest, but those are things that can be purchased over the counter. Um, now, somebody is asking uh, to define the treatment program for the uh, patients in the trial whether this is uh, remo only removing fluid or is it allowing the lymphatics to heal? Um, the answer is what we learned in the animal model is yes, it does encourage lymphatic healing. And we see uh, fairly dramatic evidence of that in animal models. If that is truly the case in humans as well, we, we will have to see if it stands the test of time. But this is not simply a fluid removal uh, program. It is actually encouraging the tissues to remodel themselves, and that includes the lymphatics as well. Somebody asked about side effects of the drug, if any. We're very gratified that the side effect potential of this drug is really low. Now, that we have to say that the drug, had, which has been used in three or four clinical trials thus far, has only been utilized in uh, perhaps 500 human subjects in history. That's a very small number compared to anything that you can buy in the drugstore. But most of the side effect potential is very modest. It's very um, exquisitely reversible. There's no major um, skeleton in the closet that we need to uh, worry about. Uh, we do acknowledge that the drug is metabolized by the liver. So we're very mindful of other drugs that can interact with it and can cause levels to become too high. And that's something we monitor very closely. Some of you that take statin drugs, for example, know that you're not supposed to eat very much grapefruit because grapefruit interacts with the statin um, uh, metabolism uh, process within the liver. It's something similar to that. So no, it does not involve grapefruit, but it involves other drug uh, potential interactions. Um, why are patients with cancer-related lymphedema not allowed in this trial? I'm sorry if you misunderstood. The patients in the trial are predominantly, can they don't have to be, but they are predominantly, and at this point ex exclusively, cancer-related. The FDA does not want us to use the drug in expanded access in cancer patients until the trial is completed. So the leg patients that are in the expanded access program are non-cancer-related lymphedema. The patients in the HEAL trial are, at the moment, exclusively cancer-related, but are allowed to be non-cancer-related if there were a patient who had, for example, a post-traumatic unilateral arm lymphedema that would qualify for the trial. They could be in the trial, but um, we are studying cancer patients at the moment. In chronic lymphedema, um, do I feel that the drug will be a lifetime requirement or less? I'm not prepared to answer that question objectively yet. Uh, what I can tell you is the following. As I mentioned a moment ago, uh, we do know that uh, the drug encourages lymphatic healing. So it would be reasonable to presuppose that the drug could in fact be given for a period of time to attain a maximal effect and then withdrawn. I have some experience like that with ketoprofen. Many of you know that I studied ketoprofen along the path 
to um, using this drug and, and identifying this drug. And in the ketoprofen experience, for various reasons along the path after completion of the trial, when patients were allowed to continue on the drug, um, some of them had reasons to discontinue it. And we saw that in the majority of patients, the, the treatment benefit was sustained, which would go along with this notion that the lymphatics uh, can heal themselves. Um, and um, basically, um, one of the promises that I see with what we're um, experiencing right now is that once we show that aspilostat can actually reverse established lymphedema, I believe there will be a path to use it preemptively in high-risk individuals to prevent the appearance of lymphedema. That is to say, for example, in a breast cancer survivor, if we had certain biomarkers or findings on ultrasound or bioimpedance or whatever it might be, uh, if we began giving ACE bilistat in that treat in that phase during which the lymphatics have been damaged but have not created lymphedema, if we can encourage lymphatic regeneration at that point, we likely could prevent the development of lymphedema in that, in that patient group. And I'm hoping that that's gonna be a very promising use of it. Somebody asked uh, how to get involved in the expanded access trial. Uh, it is um, basically, uh, if you think you are a candidate, and you have the ability to come to Palo Alto, California at three month intervals over the course of a year, and there's no reimbursement for that. That's, that has to be um, uh, self-pay. Uh, and your insurance company allows you to come to Stanford Healthcare for clinical care, then we can consider you, uh, not everybody who wants to do this can do it, um, but if you have the appropriate clinical um, presentation and you have the ability to do all those other things, we can consider you. Um, and uh, I'm going to put uh, the the email address of my coordinator for this uh, uh, program, uh, and you can email him with the specifics of your situation, and he can help you uh, to understand uh, how to go about um, getting in the queue. We We already have a queue of people that are uh, trying to come. It's very labor intensive uh, to do this. And of course, um, uh, you know, we can only accommodate so many patients per week and per month. Um, but it, it is our uh, goal to enroll, uh, we believe, 30 individuals in this particular uh, program. Are there any plans to extend the trials to Europe? Not at the moment. Uh, I would say it is very likely that European trials will uh, will need to wait for um, some uh, U.S. FDA approval before we start expanding internationally. Um, Somebody is asking if ACE Bilistat has uh, stresses on the kidney. No, it is not cleared by the kidney. It's cleared by the liver. Um, so um, somebody wants to know the 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 reasoning uh, behind excluding cancer patients from uh, from the expanded access. Well, A, it's the FDA's decision, not mine. And so I can't tell you entirely what goes into their thinking because they don't have to justify their thinking. To me, I'm gracious enough that I'm, I'm grateful enough that they allow me to do this. But I believe the thinking is that they want more concrete safety data from the formal trial because the expanded access is not a trial. It is using an investigational drug in clinical care. And even though we are collecting data, we're not, we don't have the same formality of safety uh, trial data collection as we do in the HEAL trial. And cancer patients, of course, are quite complex, even if they are full survivors and the cancer is behind them. The FDA wants to know that they're being adequately treated. So they will be included in future iterations of clinical uh, trial work related to this drug, but they cannot be part of the expanded access based upon what the FDA has told us they will allow us to do. Uh, somebody asked about side effects of the drug uh, noted. Uh, I've already talked about that. I'm not going to go into more detail idea on that. Uh, um, and again, the question about cancer, everything is based on um, the availability of um, this data to allow us to move forward. Um, 
A question about the registry, including imaging data. Yes, we have imaging data by report. We don't have the imaging in the the registry itself, but certainly um, if it were desired, uh, presumably imaging could be uh, culled out of the registry. Um, okay. Um, will parameters for safety be different once drug is released as opposed to during study period? I can't answer that. The FDA will certainly determine that, and some of that may be modified in, in, in post release surveillance as well. So uh, in theory, this looks like a very safe drug with a very low side effect profile. I imagine that the most of the safety surveillance will be related to uh, watching liver function to be certain that the drug is adequately tolerated. The remainder is uh, to be seen as we go forward. Um, so a uh, question about the length of ACE bilostat treatment. I believe, based on what I'm seeing right now, that because of the robustness with which the subcutaneous fat is, is um, being apparently resorbed with treatment, I believe that that's going to be a time-dependent phenomenon that is longer even than the six to 12 months that we in originally envisioned for observing these uh, drugs in, in, in clinical investigation. So my sense will be this is likely to be minimally a two to three to perhaps even a five-year treatment period. If indeed the, the uh, resorption of fat is a linear or maybe even an exponential process, I believe it's going to be much slower than the remodeling in the skin itself. I do believe that this is not lifelong therapy. This is very likely not to be the same as treating high blood pressure or, um, or, or dyslipidemia or rheumatoid arthritis or things that, that really require diabetes, that require one-way uh, treatment strategy. But I believe it will be an extended exposure to drug. If it comes to uh, preemptive um, preventive therapy, that's likely to be a much shorter period of time. I would imagine potentially six to 12 months. But again, um, uh, you know, the, 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 it's all open-ended. It's really a question of learning what we, we need to learn. How does one apply for expanded access? I've already addressed that. I put the, the email uh, address in the chat uh, and, Lim, and Learn has already um, repeated it. So you need to reach out to George and let him know that you're interested. But again, please only reach out if you have the capacity at your own expense to travel to Palo Alto, California at three month intervals uh, for a minimum of a year. Uh, and you have the ability through your insurance carrier to come to Stanford Healthcare. Uh, certain uh, HMOs and um, other uh, care organizations may simply not have Stanford as a provider within their provider group. And uh, then you, you could come, but it would be uh, by self-pay and that would be uh, unacceptably expensive. Um, all right. I keep getting asked about cancer. I hope I've answered that question. It's not me. It's the FDA. And basically, we have to abide by what they think is appropriate um, uh, for cancer at this time. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, somebody asked about whether EU patients can be in the expanded access program. Unfortunately, not uh, unless you are willing to fly back and forth from Europe at three month intervals at extraordinary expense, including the extraordinary expense of each of these clinic visits, which um, just like an airline ticket, if you buy it the same day, it's going to be five times as expensive as if you buy it two weeks in advance. If you come as a self-pay patient, I'm sorry to say, it's a much more expensive proposition than the bill that's generated if you have a third party payer like Medicare. Um, so, um, Somebody is asking if previously enrolled registry subjects should update information prior to the rollout of the new registry. No, please don't do that because we've already um, rolled over the data to the new system. So whatever you do in the old system is no longer going to transfer. Please wait until you either get an email reminder from the system or if you want to jump the gun, at least see that the evidence 
that um, that it has been um, made live and that you can participate. So for those of you that want to wait uh, just a moment, I'm going to now, I, I've gotten to the bottom of my uh, questions as posed to me. So I'm going to try to find the email address that you can um, respond to uh, if you are interested in, in um, participating in the HEAL trial, which is a different individual of my team. And here it comes. This is Marissa, and she would be happy to uh, give you more specific information related to you. Now, remember, we do have to go for the HEAL trial. We have to be um, very uh, specific in looking at your medical record, at looking at your medical uh, situation. And for anybody who is interested in participating in either of these programs or the Lipedema program, which will be unveiled soon, please know that even if we go through all of the screening hurdles and you come to see us, there are things that we might find on objective evaluation that make us say, sorry, we, we, can't, we cannot enroll you in this program or this trial. We do our best to pre-screen to the best of our ability, but we've had some subjects for the HEAL trial that have come even at great distance where uh, our, our best efforts were in vain because they didn't they didn't uh, pass the screening hurdles. We do we do enroll the majority of people that we pre-screen, the vast majority, but I want to let you know there are no guarantees. What we're trying to do is help all of you as expeditiously as we can, but uh, between third-party payers and the health system in which I work, and the FDA, and everything that uh, goes around a clinical trial, there are limits to what we can do, at least for now. And we're hoping that whatever we can't do today, we will be able to do tomorrow. So please remember to fill out that survey that will appear as you exit uh, this program. I want to uh, express my profound gratitude again for everybody taking time to listen to this. And please know that there's a lot of hope on the horizon. I firmly believe that. We're very excited by what we see and what we're learning. And we do hope that our work continues in this direction, unimpeded, and that soon you'll be able to go to Walgreens or CVS or Duane Reed or wherever you buy your medications and be able to buy something that will help your personal situation without having to get on a plane or enroll in a trial or do anything other than any other patient with a chronic disease is able to do to make that disease uh, come under control through modern medicine. So thanks very much for your attention and uh, we'll see one another on the next opportunity. Bye-bye now. <laughs>